Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I I feel a bit like I'm uh, sort of infiltrating here. I don't um, consider myself an artist or a programmer, really, or uh, an audio person or an animator. Um, but I do do stuff with Unreal, I suppose. Um, but I'm going to talk about a very particularly niche kind of thing, maybe, which is mocap on a budget, um, and a particularly low budget as well, which is maybe very niche. But I'm excited to talk about it um, because I think it's going to be something which is going to be building a lot in the future, just as we sort of have a future now, in the year 2016, where everybody has 4K cameras um, in their pockets, or they imminently will. Um, because we have mobile phones, I think in 10 years' time, I think motion capture is just going to be something which is very, very ubiquitous. Um, just a little bit about me, I think, which is relevant to this talk. Um, I have kind of two hobbies currently, which is sort of um, indie animation y stuff, and another hobby which is performing improv comedy. Um, and also machine learning, um, which kind of pops up later, which is why I'm mentioning it. Um, and the thing is, I'm really, really fascinated by motion capture, and especially now that we have things like the Unreal Engine where you can drop something in, which has been motion captured, and you have all these wonderful assets from um, the example content, which is free, for example, and we just recently had 4.11 where you have the new shaders and stuff. Um, but I think until the last 24 months or so, it has been sort of completely, utterly out of the reach of people like myself, and it still mostly is. Um, but it's just about getting to that point where crazy people like me can just sort of start experimenting. Um, and the thing is, I'm a strong believer in people being amateurs and experimenting in a very amateur way in their living rooms and stuff, because um, even before you get to the point of being an indie, because you know, I think lots of people in this room would, would realize that being an indie is actually a real lifestyle choice. Um, but it's out of necessity for me, because at points I will often struggle to actually get out of the house. Um, and so being able to experiment with, with something and to learn and hone a skill in your living room is very, very important to me. Um, but you have to do things very quickly and cheaply, therefore. Um, why quickly? Um, because uh, I'm also a perfectionist, and the thing is you can just spend years and years and years grinding away at something and you don't actually make anything. Um, and if you're an amateur where well, you're not getting paid or you haven't got someone telling you to get on and make something, then that's, that's really disastrous. Um, if you're working in a team, people get demoralized if you don't do something quickly. Um, you run out of money just because you have bills and, and uh, rent and all these things, which no matter how cheaply you can do something, these things stay the same. Um, and you lose sight of what the actual project, project is. You spend two years doing something and you realize actually it's, it's awful and you wish you hadn't ever done it. Um, and you might realize that the audience actually doesn't really enjoy what it is you've spent two years making. So doing things quickly is always going to be better at an amateur scale. Um, and so cheaply is also very useful, and that's actually really the main meat of what I'm talking about. Um, so I think what has really struck me is that you can 3D print lots of things that you previously had to spend thousands of pounds getting even an approximation of. Um, and in this case, in this talk, that's, uh, that deals mostly with the uh, facial tracking. Um, and another great thing recently is action cameras are getting very, very good, and they're getting very, very cheap, and this is very useful for facial tracking. And again, they're, they, they're ubiquitous. Um, same thing for microphones and smartphones. They're, they are now ubiquitous, really. Um, people want to have lapel microphones for smartphones, and smartphones are getting incredibly cheap now. Um, and the big thing for me recently has been open source software. So I'm a big believer in Blender, even if it is really ugly and horrible. Um, and also that goes for face tracking as well. Um, there's some really good libraries that basically emulate uh, products that you could actually, if you're not careful, spend thousands of pounds on. And I'm going to go into detail about that. And of course, uh, freely available render engines like uh, UE4, which is, as we know, free or has been made free. Um, so, yes, motion capture is what I'm talking about. Um, for the body, um, oh, I should say, sorry, um, this is all completely out of context. I do actually, I, did, I initially did um, intend to talk about all the philosophy behind what I'm doing and all the context and all that stuff, but um, just in case, in case I run out of time, I thought I'd put that stuff at the end, and then if I have time for all that stuff, then we'll talk about that. 
but if I don't, then we can actually get to the actual meat of what I'm talking about. So, uh, body, what I use is um, a solution from IPI Soft, which is just an optical-based solution. It uses PlayStation Eye cameras, that's five pounds each. So a bit of math, that's 30 pounds. Um, light stands, because you need to elevate these things, so that's eight pounds each. Um, and it's an advantage for amateur folks like myself because it's very, very portable. You can rent out a space somewhere in London and do some motion capture with, uh, for whatever purposes you're intending to do. Um, you can use increasingly competent mini ITX PCs to uh, capture this. Um, GPUs are getting better, so these solutions, which are actually quite slow a few years ago, are actually more or less tolerable. Um, and they're very, very accessible for people who um, aren't motion capture performers by trade. So we had a really wonderful demonstration last month of the perception neuron with the gyroscopes. Um, but um, even putting aside issues like cost, um, that is, uh, it, it still takes time to put on. Um, if you have eight people in a room, then um, it's going to take even longer. And then there's issues of interference from metal and electric circuits and so on. Um, and also, as a little detail, um, I think optical things will dovetail very nicely into the next 10 years with machine learning, ma machine vision, um, which I think is just going to be in insane. Um, so just a, a sort of um, uh, demonstration of that. I have this guy here. Uh, what am I doing? Here we go. So this is just a demonstration of the optical. There we are. Um, thing, so that's me in my kitchen, um, and it's a, a rather, I'm not entirely sure if it's an entirely accurately proportioned model of myself, but there he, he's alongside me. Um, I'm not an artist, as I said. Um, and the nice thing is it also works well for impromptu performances or multiple people as well, um, so you could actually walk into the room unannounced and actually start doing some motion capture. Um, so here we have um, a side-by-side -side comparison. This is actually in Blender, so this is multiple people. Um, and as you can sort of see, I'll skip through. But it, the thing is, for an amateur sort of scale thing, it's actually quite competent. Um, and there's some wonderful performing going on here. Uh, anyway, so there we go. This is before all the niceness is, is uh, smothered over in Unreal Engine. Um, so, so that is the body. Uh, I go full screen again. All right, cool. Do, 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 do. Uh, so yeah, the face capture rig, this is the big thing really, because if you have six performers trying to capture the face, um, it's uh, just, uh, it, it's impossibly expensive. The consumer entry level sort of solutions can be maybe 2,000 pounds each. So for six or eight people, that's obviously not, possible, and I'd, I'd argue even one person is not really possible. Um, it also ha it has to be lightweight, and it has to be immune from shaking um, cause to get a good track. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm using Intel RealSense to scan someone's head in depth, and then you just print out a, a, um, a, a, a personalized brace for that person. And even though that is a personalized thing, it's only about 30, 40 pounds each. Um, and then you can just, again, use an action camera for about 55 pounds to get the, the, the footage, which can go up to 120 frames a second for a get a good track. And it can even use like a sort of consumer level USB charger to plug into the camera, take the battery out, and it's even lighter. Um, and what you get is, what do we, do we have? Um, uh, just for the sake of time, I won't bother showing you the, uh, the capture thing. Um, but then to actually get the landmarks, then you can use open source uh, libraries. I was actually originally planning on using a solution called FaceShift, but then Apple bought it, and um, I, don't, I didn't really appreciate that happening. Um, but Dlib, you just, you just feed in JPEG sequences and it spits out landmarks, basically. It's very, very competent, actually. Um, it's just based on machine vision regression trees and lots of other stuff I don't really understand, but it works. It's actually quite easy to use. Um, it, you, just, you just feed in correctly labeled poses and it actually does a very competent job. It's written in Python and C++, so even someone like me can do it. Um, and the rig is just based on morph targets. Um, and it's just, it's, just it's, a, it's a solution like Blender that is sort of sampling between points on the facial landmarks to infer what, how, to what degree you want the morph targets to contribute to the 
ultimate pose. So I have uh, just a video here. You might even have audio, who knows? Oh, God. He test the all up test, which is what I'm calling it, um, which means that I'm testing the head mounted camera with the portable battery. Um. So this is very, very early stuff. Um, but uh, this, is, this is exceptionally crude and exceptionally early, and I think. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm talking quite speculatively here, but I think this is, I, I'm actually quite happy with this for something which I made, and the thing is I don't know anything about rigging a face or indeed Python or indeed much about anything. So the fact that I can make this is quite promising, I think, for people who actually know what they're doing. Um, so that's that. Oh, why does it start again? There we go. Oh, that's, sorry, that's like, well, that's what DLib gives you. Um, and that's just an open source library. Um, audio, diegetic, like the in-world stuff, is this is like the Unreal specific stuff, I suppose. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Specifically to Unreal for the sake of time, um, what I'm really, really excited about with Unreal Engine is that talking about doing things quickly and cheaply, um, rather than having to add in Foley um, manually, things like footsteps and um, uh, cloth is sort of what I've what I've done is um, used blueprint to sort of sort of sample the uh, position of bones um, relative to the floor and relative to each other to get like the velocity of a bone um, and then you can sort of say well at that point play a footstep or play some cloth sound um, and if you're sort of trying to make a 20 minute sitcom in a week then this is very very useful um, and it's sort of just nice it nicely grounds the animation in the world. Um, how am I doing for time? Sorry, I didn't actually. Okay, I suppose I have a very crude video showing this. Um, there we go. There we go. This is. Da, 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 da. So. So it's just sort of sampling where the feet hit the ground. There we go. Um, early days. <laughs> It's going to be the best footstep uh, sitcom ever. Um, uh, Non-diegetic. And this is stuff I was really, really excited about um, as well, which is that games have this wonderful thing about interactive music. Um, and if you imagine that you are doing a live performance where the computer knows who each character is, where they are in the world, what they're doing, um, suddenly you have these, some very exciting possibilities. Um, I don't actually have anything, anything to show on this front just because I, I only just sort of looked into it the last week or so. But it's not so hard to imagine being able to have music um, being generated almost in real time alongside a performance. Um, and again, in the interest of speed and um, cheapness um, for something like a for something like a linear media, right? Uh, da, da, da. Blueprint is ideal. There we go. So you, you, uh, I gave myself today to rehearse this, um, and then I just ended up playing around with lights in 4.11. Um, so, uh. oh yes, uh, but I am, weird, I am looking very, for, uh, lo very much looking forward to the updates for Unreal in uh, the audio system, which they say is coming, I think. Um, th but things like keeping track of where the audio listener is, um, although they did actually just introduce some new stuff for occlusion and stuff, didn't they? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> um, da, 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 da. Oh, and finally, rendering. Um, it's an exciting time. 4.11 improvements, example, con example content, and a sequencer um, being put in 4.12. That's true. Um, what I really like is that um, going forward a few years, the idea of, a, uh, of instancing a performance so that uh, rather than knowing exactly what you're going to use a performance for ahead of time, um, actually almost having a system capture a performance and then you, then you can decide later on how you're going to use it is really quite interesting because um, just the, uh, the volatility of my project means that at certain times I'll be telling people it's a, it's a motion comic or it's a sitcom or it's a, a radio play. And if you actually have a system like Unreal Engine 4 where you are uh, loading a performance into that, then you have this incredible flexibility about what you can do. So I have 
um, when I'm telling people it's a motion comic, I'm sort of putting a post-process effect on um, a performance and then using um, Blueprint to extract the most dynamic poses based on just feeding in the uh, animation. Or if it's a radio play, then it's, it's a question of just um, scripting where the audio listener should be based on the sort of spatialized performances of someone where you just have the audio files coming out of the mouths of these 3D characters in 3D space. Obviously, then it's just spitting it out to an audio file. Um, so, but rather than using uh, Unreal Engine then as a game engine, as it were, it's more of a sort of real-time simulation of where things are and then where light is and where sound is so that you just have flexibility to do with a performance what you will. Um, there we go, talking about that. Um, now, for the sake of time, do I have to talk about that? Um... Do, 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 do. And that thing for part two, clearly. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, again, I've, I have no track of time. How long? Am I, how am I doing? Um, okay, I think that that's probably about it. Really, I can sum up the last few pages in just saying machine learning will solve all these problems. Um, uh, I, I'm very, very excited about taking that sort of um, extraction of a performance, a live performance, ultimately, um, especially with machine vision, and sort of feeding that into a, um, a neural network and sort of seeing what it makes of it. Um, did anybody see the conference the other day where they're sort of, uh, the NVIDIA conference where they're sort of showing machine learning, um, producing paintings in a particular style, and then they can sort of ask it to make, take away the clouds? Anyway, machine vision is great. Um, and that's pretty much, oh, I suppose, hang on, I, I guess I should show this thing which I spent hours making today. I meant I didn't rehearse the speech, so I should probably talk about it. Um, here we go. Uh, actually, no, I won't. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. The thing is, it hasn't got any audio because um, there's a glitch in 4.11's um, um, matinee where you can't see the morph targets update alongside the scrubbing. So um, there's no audio because <laughs> I couldn't actually place it in. That's my excuse. Um, where is it? Is it that one? Okay, no. this is ah. the... Okay, there is audio, I'm lying, but <laughs> it's out of sync, so I'm not, I'm not going to play it because it looks stupid. There we go, all right. So this is the same, this is me in my kitchen from earlier. Um, and the, yeah. Can I just say how incredible the, uh, the lighting channels are um, for things like um, fill lights and... Uh, because it really makes a difference between it looking like a sort of really ugly, horrible pile of nonsense and actually a person standing in a corridor. Um, so yeah, this so this is um, this is very very early days. Um, I guess I should frame my entire talk in that I'm going to sort of make a blog and I'm sort of going to be updating the progress on it. So this is this is v dot one, v zero dot one. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. I think that about wraps it up. <laughs>